Welcome to Mobile News Weekly, I'm Sylvie Barak. Coming up on this week's show, we take a look at the latest from the AT&T T-Mobile merger, swing by the RCR Global Tour in Bellevue, and find out what makes Seattle such a mobile wireless hotspot. But first, let's catch up on the wireless news from this week. Google's chief legal officer David Drummond has launched a scathing attack on rivals he claims are using patents to attack the firm. In a blog post, Drummond said Android was in the firing line of a hostile, organized campaign by Microsoft, Oracle, Apple, and other companies. The remarks refer to the Nortel patents, recently snapped up by a consortium of mobile players, including Rim and Nokia, which outbid Google's own $900 million offer for the portfolio. Google says that if invoked, the patents could threaten Android's free status by making the operating system expensive for phone makers to license. Creator of the mobile internet, OpenWave, has announced it will be cutting 18 to 20 percent of its staff after a disappointing financial quarter. The company has seen its revenues plummet 19 percent year over year to just 35.2 million as sales declined and operating costs increased. Operating losses reached $10.6 million this quarter. OpenWave says the layoffs, which will affect 100 workers, should help reduce annual OPEX by $30 million. RIM has released a whole host of new BlackBerry devices, boasting its new operating system. The firm officially launched the Bowl 9900 and 9930, said to be the thinnest BlackBerry smartphones ever, and the first to sport both a keyboard and touchscreen, with added support for NFC. The Canadian phone maker also lit up its offerings with the new Torch 9810 with a larger 3.2-inch screen and slide-out keyboard, as well as the Torch 9850 and 9860 with 3.7-inch displays. All the new phones boast the new BlackBerry 7 OS. The United States government has come to an agreement with its neighbors in Mexico and Canada regarding the use of 700 and 800 megahertz spectrum. The 700 megahertz agreement should allow carriers on both sides of the border to use mobile broadband networks on that spectrum fully. Clearwire has ended months of speculation by announcing it's finally set to join the LTE space, overlaying its WiMAX network with equipment compatible with TDD LTE. That's not to say the firm will be scrapping WiMAX altogether, however, with plans to continue supporting Sprint's 4G offering. Clearwire's plans to build out an LTE network are of course dependent on the firm securing funding to the tune of some $600 million. Chip giant Qualcomm has renamed its Snapdragon chipset, supposedly to make it easier for the consumer to understand. The firm has renamed its offerings based on performance in ascending order. S1 now refers to the 65 nanometer 1 gigahertz offering, S2 45 nanometer 1.5 gigahertz offering, S3 the dual core version of that chipset, and S4 will include SOCs from 1.6 gigahertz to 2.5 gigahertz on 28 nanometer technology coming next year. This has been the top stories from this week. When we come back, we'll keep you updated on the AT&T T-Mobile merger. AT&T shocked the mobile industry when it announced plans to acquire T-Mobile back in March. Dan Meyer has been following the story closely and has more. AT&T's announcement earlier this year that it wanted to acquire T-Mobile USA for $39 billion rocked the mobile space and has been the center of conversation ever since. The deal would combine the industry's number two and number four domestic operators into a new number one supercarrier with size and scope vastly superior to its rivals. Well, I think it's, it's uh, proceeding along, you know, what typically the, um, uh, what, a, what a major merger, in the fashion a major mer merger, you know, would proceed. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, I, I think that AT&T um, set the tone early because it rolled out the proposed deal with all the savvy and sophistication of a political campaign. However, since the deal was announced, opposition to the acquisition has begun to ferment. Many claim that the deal will reduce competition in the mobile space and be bad for consumers. I, mean, I think we will never rest until the transaction's blocked. Yeah. 
And I think we do feel good and, and gratified that so many different consumer groups and public interest groups, uh, businesses, uh, individual consumers are, are agreeing with some of the points that we make. But it's, it's much bigger than just Sprint. It really is an industry, multi-industry battle, multi-sector battle. As one of the more vocal opponents to the acquisition, Sprint Nextel believes that approval of the deal, regardless of conditions, would be to the detriment to the entire mobile space and consumers. We're 83 days into the proceedings yeah. since the FCC issued the public notice, yeah. and there have been about 188,000 comments filed with the commission, which is 40,000 more than were filed in Comcast, NBC over the course of a year-long proceeding. Yeah. The comments are overwhelmingly opposed to the merger, yeah. and they're citing any number of concerns. Uh, higher prices, reduced competition, reduced innovation, uh, higher unemployment, uh, reduced investment. On issue after issue, we think they're right. Supporters, on the other hand, note that the combination is necessary to provide sufficient spectrum resources needed to meet the increasing demand for mobile broadband services. AT&T has done a very effective job in kind of creating and sustaining a narrative that this is, this is a good deal because it, uh, it furthers um, at least some uh, uh, you know, of uh, the FCC's objectives, universal broadband, uh, getting um, more, service, <coughs> excuse me, more service out to rural areas. AT&T had said it hoped to have a ruling on the deal by the end of the year. RCR Wireless News traveled to Washington, D.C. to get a read on how the process was progressing Jeff Silva, longtime Washington Observer and current Senior Policy Director at Medley Global Advisors, noted that while recent opposition to the proposed deal has grown louder, the deal still appears to be leaning towards approval, perhaps sometimes early next year. AT&T, in a perfect world, I think would like uh, to get the deal cleared uh, this year, rather next year, and I think it made the case that it would be good for the administration. I, I would be surprised if the the deal is so big, complex, politically sensitive. Um, it, it, um, I'd be surprised, it's possible, but I'd be surprised if they, it can be completed uh, in this calendar year. Yeah. I think it's gonna um, probably, uh, the review will bleed into early 2012. The various government agencies involved with overseeing this acquisition have remained quiet on which way they might be leaning leaving sufficient room for industry observers to attempt to read the dried tea leaves. This is Dan Meyer, RCR Wireless News. We'll continue bringing you updates from this industry-shaking events over the coming weeks. When we come back, we'll take a look at what makes Seattle such a buzzing mobile scene. Seattle, situated in America's northwest, is a booming hip metropolis with a thriving tech sector, strong startup scene, and a resilient economy. Tech titans T-Mobile, Amazon, Microsoft, and HTC have all made Seattle their U.S. home. AT&T and Verizon also boast significant operations in the area. Seattle has long history with wireless, going back to the days of McCraw Cellular, but with venture capital springing up all over the city, and startups booming, even modern day monsters like Google and Facebook have appeared on the scene. Um, so beyond the capital side of it, it's also a great environment because you've got a pretty good talent pool here that hasn't yet been completely dominated by a few big companies like down in, in the Bay Area, uh, where it's pretty hard as a startup sometimes to compete from a hiring point of view with the Twitters and Facebooks and Googles and Apples and so forth of the world. But you have the Microsofts, the Amazons, the Facebooks. We do, and of course you, now you're seeing Facebook uh, open here. There's multiple locations of Google that have opened here. So they're starting to see the same thing, but they don't have quite as much sway. And I think um, there's more of a flow in and out of the Microsofts and Amazons um, with respect to startups. Uh, there are people who who do startups for a while and then go back to Microsoft or go to Amazon. And there are people at those larger companies that decide they want to try something else. According to the city's Office of Economic Development, Seattle's ICT sector includes more than 850 companies, 1,800 jobs, and contributes over $3.5 billion to the city's economy. Um, what attracted me was the startup business group 
uh, that Microsoft had, had just recently created. So uh, I came to campus and I met with a number of the senior folks who have a really great combination of experience of both working you know, inside Microsoft, inside a large organization that has lots of assets and a tremendous you know, roadmap, as well as working outside the company and understanding you know, more of the consumer viewpoint. And those, those combinations really convinced me that this was a great place to be. Software developers, engineers, programmers, analysts, and graphic designers have all converged on the city, giving Seattle the second highest concentration of programmers and engineers in the US and the third highest in the nation for all ICT occupations. Intel even recently singled out Seattle as the most unwired city in America, saying it was the easiest place in which to find wireless internet connections. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, uh, you know, Microsoft started uh, in the Puget Sound area, and so that has really created um, a center of gravity for technology uh, here in Washington. Um, the mobile uh, sort of aspect of that technology space, um, I can personally trace back to the Macaw cellular days, right? Where Macaw, uh, they um, you know, started a, a network operator. Um, they had a terrific reputation. Um, I have a, a, a lot of friends who used to work for Macaw, and they speak very fondly of those days. Um, but really, coming out of that genesis and into the AT&T era, and then into you know onto Singular, um, there's been a real heavy investment in you know cellular technology uh, here uh, in the Puget Sound area. Some of Seattle's greatest advantages in terms of tech talent lie in the city's proximity to good universities access to multiple venture capital companies, a large base of existing software companies, and cutting-edge infrastructure, which fosters innovation while being less intense than New York or Silicon Valley. Uh, actually, I moved first. I came to uh, the US and thought I was going to be in the Bay Area because that's where all the startups are. And I had a bunch of interviews down there. And I came up here uh, for a weekend to visit a friend that worked at Amazon. And I knew one company up here. And uh, I never went back to the Bay Area. I just liked it so much in Seattle. It's a, it's a slightly smaller town. It was a little bit less hectic than the Bay Area was in 98. In 98 in the Bay Area, you know, you couldn't get a house. You couldn't get a car. It was sort of very crazy. And uh, Seattle, I, I walked into this company. The only, comp the only person I knew there was the CEO. And he basically said, well, we'll get you a, you know, we'll rent you a car for the first month and you're not going back to the Bay Area. So I stayed here. So, uh, you know, I, I think I'd rather be here than the Bay Area in terms of the talent competition. I mean, I talk to people in the Bay Area that have developer slots unfilled for six months. And, you know, we just put out some, you know, ads for new positions and we have, you know, 30, 40 good applicants. So uh, I think it's not too bad here by comparison. There's a reason those big companies have moved up here. For me, it's more about the, you know, the startup culture building, and I can sense it. I wasn't totally sure coming here what it was all about. I knew it was a good tech city because of Amazon, because of Microsoft. Um, but actually coming here and seeing the community working in this building with 20 other startups and, you know, getting to know other startups all across the city. I mean, there's more than just this building happening. It's all over. While the tech talent raves about the quality of life in Seattle for the most part, there are some downsides to the city's charms, namely the high cost of living, terrible traffic, and the weather. Uh, it's a good mix. We try to sneak out for happy hours and probably come back after happy hours sometime and stay here till, till two or three. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, when we're shipping, we're here all night. Other times we try to get out and play. The weather's been nice the last couple months, so, you know, getting out and hiking, um, exploring Seattle's outdoors for me because I just moved here has been a lot of fun. Well, the rain and the weather is the worst. I'm a golfer, and so I'm just trying to find time to, to play golf in the winter, and it's pretty brutal. Um, the best part, um, I think it just, it's a livable, easy city and there's good skiing. You can go out on the lake in the summer. There's a lot of uh, positive to sort of the outdoors here. Um, but yeah, the weather sucks. But while the weather may put a damper on Seattle's shine, its tech stars seem to have internalized the mantra, no rain, no gain. We like to keep things fast and furious here at RCR, and this week's speed test brought to you from Baltimore is no exception. RCR's Dan Meyer has more. This is Dan Meyer with RCR Wireless News. We are here on the streets of Baltimore in uh, Camden Yards, uh, home of uh, both the Orioles as well as uh, 
Sprint Nextel's WiMAX network, as well as uh, Verizon Wireless's LT network. And we figured while we were in town, we would do a little speed testing to see what uh, consumers on the streets here in Baltimore would expect to get uh, speed-wise from their smartphones. First up to bat here is the uh, Verizon Wireless Droid Charge, which runs on their LTE network. We are using the uh, Ookla uh, application to uh, test the speeds here, and we'll see what we get here uh, on the device. Now for their services, Verizon does uh, uh, advertise uh, download speeds of between 5 and 12 megabits per second uh, for consumers. We'll see how close we get to that on the, on the downlink here. All right, there we go. So it looks like uh, for the latency, we got a 306 milliseconds, which is a little bit high for a typical LTE network, but not out of the range. Uh, for download speeds, uh, 5.6 megabits per second, which is uh, in line with what Verizon uh, Wireless advertises, so not too out of line there either. Upload speeds, uh, just over 2 megabits, which is maybe on the low end, but still uh, pretty fast for a mobile broadband service. Uh, I think overall, it uh, seems like the network here in the Baltimore area seems to be uh, up to snuff. Next up, we'll have the uh, Sprint Nextel Evo 4G device running on Sprint's WiMAX network here in the town. Uh, it should be noted, too, that uh, the uh, Baltimore market was the first market that uh, Sprint Nextel launched its WiMAX service a couple of years ago. So uh, theoretically, it should have the uh, most robust coverage uh, in the area. So we'll see what we get here. All right, well, you can see from the uh, latency test there, 118 milliseconds, which is considerably faster than the Verizon Wireless LTE network and, uh, and very fast for, for pretty much any mobile broadband network. Uh, download speed of just over 7.7 .7 megabits per second, which is uh, on the high side really for what, uh, what Sprint advertises. They typically advertise between 3 and 6 megabits per second, so 7.7 .7 is very fast. On the, on the uh, upload speed, uh, just over uh, 1.4 megabits, which is pretty much in line with uh, what you get with the WiMAX network. I think uh, uh, Sprint Nextel in general kind of limits uh, upload speeds to around 1.5 megabits, so uh, it's hitting that, that pretty closely. So overall, it looked like the, uh, the Sprint Nextel uh, network here in town is, is, is very robust. All right, well, as we can see, uh, both networks perform pretty well here in the Baltimore market. Uh, the Sprint network uh, performed very well, I would say. The WiMAX uh, network here is very robust, uh, which, you know, I guess makes sense since this was one of the first markets where they launched service, uh, provide network speeds on the higher end of their advertised range, and seem to really perform pretty well in the area. Uh, Verizon Wireless's LTE network also performed very well, uh, maybe at the lower end of its advertised ratings, but still uh, a very robust network. I think overall consumers in the area should, uh, should see uh, pretty good uh, mobile broadband speeds with their, with their devices. Again, this is Dan Meyer with RCR Wireless News in Baltimore. When we return, we take you to Bellevue for the highlights from RCR's recent mobile broadband event. We're here today at the RCR Wireless Conference in Bellevue, which is just across the road from Seattle. And we've got a whole host of wireless industry players here with us today, from three major carriers, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and we've also got a whole host of over-the-top developers and app developers. You name them, we've got them here today. With three of America's top carriers taking the stage in Bellevue, current mobile broadband trends were top of the agenda with topics ranging from build-out of 4G LTE networks to DAS to value-added services. ...about uh, basically the space of mobile right now. It's uh, right at the center of the consumer electronics world, uh, the center of um, the content world, and now we have the networks that are delivering the speeds to really give the experiences that uh, I think we've all talked about on different panels for years. So. As the day progressed, it became abundantly clear that the gap perceived between the network pipes and the cutting-edge applications and services that run on them was being rapidly filled in by the carrier, attempting to capitalize on infrastructure investments by offering users more of the things they've been asking for. You know, we, we have um, seen a growing demand, I think everyone in this panel would say the same thing, around throughput capabilities and reliability, latency requirements for applications that our customers are really asking for. Um, they've been asking for it for several years. So when I think about um, innovative and next generation networks, it, for us it really comes down to that 4G LTE platform. Literally the best plan we've launched. So when you look at all that, you got a great network device and plan. So what I focus on with the team is 
so what? What can consumers do with that? And so that's what we're really trying to bring to life. So explaining what you can do with all this great stuff. We talk about data, frankly, is, is pretty boring when you talk about it as data. But uh, if you talk about you can get music, movies, books, games, magazines, all these great things on your device, then consumers understand it and get excited. It's not just consumer devices being driven forward at blistering speed thanks to telecom innovation, but all kinds of things being synced with the network for a more high-tech, connected future. I mean, the um, proliferation of connected things is happening real-time right now. So um, while the device that I may carry on me may be a PDA at one point, a smartphone, could potentially be a tablet depending on the venue that I'm in. I think it's the utility of the, of the device. Smart grids, smart buildings, smart devices all go back to your first question, require smart and innovative networks to run them. Um, but I 100% I agree with that. There's this uh, swirling ecosystem of connected things that is uh, growing at an extremely rapid pace right now. Of course, as connected devices become more prevalent, Carriers are also having to face the challenges of getting all that exciting data to and from users, wherever they may be, whether high up in a cement office building, a hospital, or a crowded stadium. The good customer experience in venues where we know that approximately 90% of phone calls are being made from inside the building out. Uh, in regards to the high cap venues, high capacity venues like sport arenas, uh, here at Crestfield and Safeco Field, um, same with Husky Stadium here in Seattle. What's up, how are we going to have come up with a solution to provide our customer base with the customer experience that that you know that they, they normally should deserve to to have? And laying down all that infrastructure is all well and good as long as it's affordable and people truly want to use it to its fullest. We're really trying to light up the world of 4G and explain to consumers what's possible. And I think as, as a carrier, and Vern, i got to challenge you on, you're, you're the only one here out of oh, the no, box. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that was... Uh, I don't come from a carrier's background, <laughs> so I get to look at uh, the carrier assets, and it's like a candy store of uh, potential. Um, I think the um, development and the capabilities of LTE long-term uh, are, are really sky's the limit. Um, and I, but again, I do think they... Part of discussions with the engineers, uh, they said, well, people might use it, the network and all this. I go, let's just try it. Let's embrace yes. Let's give it a shot. While not everybody was convinced that pushing the new networks to capacity so early on was advisable, especially with discussions of network monetization ongoing, others took the stance of, if you've got it, flaunt it. For more information on upcoming RCR events, go to rcrwireless.com or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks so much for watching this week's show. Tune in next time for more from RCR Wireless's Mobile News Weekly.